Right, so hello everybody. Um, as Kevin will have already said, uh, my name is Chris Amory. Um, I currently work at Jet2, as has been already clarified. Um, so one of the talks I did um, internally in Jet2 not long ago was about around the ASP.NET ASP core health check stuff. The reason this car caught my eye, um, something we do quite abundantly across Jet2, as you can imagine, in as large systems and microservices, um, it's quite imperative like to have like monitoring of all these different microservices, like especially on larger scales where you might have dozens and dozens of these across the board. Um, and obviously with all the new development we do in, jo in Jet2 now, uh, being on ASP.NET Core, um, obviously it can't it kind of stood out because we don't really want to have to like rewrite um, everything that we kind of got already in ra around health checks or repurpose what we've got potentially. Like if we can like reuse something which effectively fulfills everything, all the qualities we need already, that'd be great. Um, so essentially, I'm looking to um, discuss the qualities this brings and why I think it should be on your radar if you're actively doing some ASP.NET Core development in the pipeline and how it can integrate with something you might have already. So, so everyone in the room, has anyone done anything around health checks before, whether it be in, AS, in ASP.NET Core or the old, good old .NET? Any hands up? Okay, that's quite a lot less than I was expecting. So essentially, just to give a qu quick background, health checking is essentially it's the process where we have our own self-contained applications like microservices um, across a whole wider system, um, essentially reporting upon their status, like their overall health, like it could be stuff like, is there a connectivity to a database is well established? Um, can they connect to different other APIs that are dependent upon? Are they within like memory like allocations and all that, all that kind of stuff? Um, it can be absolutely like this sort of stuff. I think can be absolutely invaluable to um, DevOps. Like if you need to like essentially debug a, a particular bug, for instance, for instance, like constant monitoring and so forth. If you didn't have these like health checks in place, then that's kind of little way of telling like how well they're really behaving underneath the hood. It's nice to have that visibility, I think. Um, however, as I've kind of mentioned in .NET Core, um, well, as of .NET Core 2.2, Microsoft have kind of introduced a framework formally um, that is now supported by Microsoft. But essentially, this is a framework that has been supported a lot longer in the, in the form of Beat Pulse, if anyone's ever heard of that. Um, so essentially, I'm going to focus around what Microsoft have introduced for us. Well, essentially brought under their own helm, like to the wider audience. Um, so essentially, um, so to discuss the industry trends before moving on, I think everybody in the room is aware that .NET Core has become more and more ubiquitous all the time. Like it's becoming everywhere. It's becoming like this de facto kind of development of anything moving forward. And with that in mind, well, it, which I think is a fantastic thing. Obviously, it does bring about more complications around a large system where it's great to do all the new development in .NET Core. But I think one of the complications is you might have a lot of old legacy systems that you still have to maintain. They're all, main they're all written in .NET Core. Well, not not .NET Core, uh, no .NET, sorry. Um, where, I don't know, if you're like us in Jet2, you might have the health checks already written in place. Um, so what do you do about that? Do you simply just, do you just rewrite what you've got? Like, do you just repurpose everything you've got? Um, or do you like rewrite what you've got? Of course you don't. It's not practical to kind of like rewrite what you've got just to like adhere to .NET Core. So you, in reality, I think you have to kind of like maintain these move, moving forward. You have to support these old ones, like you have to support the older infrastructure along with going to the new. And this is where I think like the health check stuff really comes in. Um, so what do so what do we do with our implementations for health checking .NET Core? What if like so what if we've already handcrafted like health checks in .NET in the old .NET already? Um, like I say, um, we don't we really want to, uh, if we have to repurpose it, then it's kind of like a wasted business effort. What we want to kind of do is just like leverage something that's neat out of the box, brings out a lot of valuable, and that's exactly what the um, ASP, well, ASP.NET Health Checks does. So that is why there is another way. And like I say, there's a wealth of value out of the box. I'm going to illustrate this in the form of a demo at the end of it, and how easy it is to like just extend it beyond and why I think um, there'll be more members of the community, why they might extend it for us. So 
some more pit, more frameworks you can shamelessly use in your application to bring more value about your, the health checking that you do. It's because um, as you, as you, for a lot of people you might know um, in .NET Core, it's all by well, ASP.NET Core. It's kind of built around the concept of dependency injection, and with that in mind, it integrates in that kind of form very ruthlessly. It's very simple to integrate with the existing ASP.NET Core pipeline in the form of middleware. Uh, again, I'll show you after afterwards. And like I say, it is designed literally from the ground up to integrate ASP.NET Core. It's not repurposed around the old form of ASP.NET. Um, it's got a uniform interface for extension and for allevi alleviating duplication. So by that, I kind of mean, uh, you know, I almost don't know what I kind of mean at this point. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, so essentially, because it provides that uniform interface, um, it essentially means that like, there's probably less risk of duplication whereby someone might like try and rewrite their own. Like this is something you kind of had to adhere to. Um, also, it's easy to modify like how you output that. So essentially, one reason why I kind of point out is like it's safe. You got existing systems already that have their old their own health checks. It's very easy to integrate with those if you have to conform contractually to those. Again, something I can illustrate to you. And another benefit, um, you can even configure it to push um, reports routinely. Like that's a bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but is like some of the value that it brings additionally. If that's something that you wish to do, like without having to like pursue the dashboards yourself and so forth. So why consider it? So as you know, Microsoft, like one of the biggest names in the big business. It provides exceptional assurance that like, support for this framework won't die or dwindle around anytime soon. Um, it's always going to have their backing. Um, it, it provides a lot of reassurance. You don't want to have to pick a framework which only a few, only a few members are maintaining at any given point. You might f find like you want to do something with it. Well, you might want some updates to it, but it's not maintained or there's some bugs. Again, it just brings about complications. The official integration, I think, it greatly exposes the visibility of the framework. So I think there's a lot more chance that there's people out there, like in terms of third parties or like individual developers and so forth, they might bring about their own implementation to bring about more health checks, like in addition to the ones you get out of the box, which there are many, I should add. And on, I didn't quite rewrite this presentation very well, sorry, because I shamelessly repurposed it. Um, it reduces the code maintenance on anyone's part by um, alleviating the need to repurpose any existing code, which you might have already had in .NET, which we do in, in JET2. Like we have our own health check stuff for, for regular old .NET, but we don't have we didn't have any for .NET Core. So the, the, the choice was after this presentation to pursue with this because it it just integrated really well. Like all you have to do essentially is just modify how it should output like contractually to fit in with the existing infrastructure. So I think with much ado, has anyone got any questions up to this point before I go into a demo, test driver demo? No? Oh. We should talk about this health check API then. So do you envision some of the application actually calling that health check API to find out whether the application is working on that? Well, that's kind of like what's it's kind of to expose, well, it's kind of to expose the whole um, status of a given application. Like, yeah. So one of the things out of the box, which I will neatly come on to, there's a um, UI portal essentially that you can like that comes as standard. It's something you can configure yourself, or you can write your own. There's many different ways you could go about it. Um, so I will go over the UI stuff very f first. Um, so from the, from the start, I'll show you what it looks like first and how this all work behaves underneath. So this is something that comes out of the box with um, the health checks. I've for the API, which I shall look at after this, um, there are three health checks. One that's called a DB health check. Notice how it's refreshing by its, on its own on an interval basis. Um, the bottom one, so I'll explain the bottom one in a minute. Top one is a DB health check just to ensure that connectivity to a database can be established. Could be on a private box, could be various reasons why it doesn't connect, um, or you want to check something in the schema. Um, private memory health check, make sure it's within fresh light, like, certain light like, is not bloated essentially, like it's, it's, not, it's not exceeding its usage. Um, 
And the last one is an even second time health check, which is something I implemented just to kind of ex like explain how it is easy to extend this for yourself. To go over the code, um, one would think that you have to kind of like, this is the, uh, this is the wrong one, sorry. So one would think with the uh, UI stuff, you have to um, essentially introduce like various different controllers, actions, views. The reality is none of that. All you have to do um, is essentially register it as a service. And then essentially you can append it as middleware down here, just to say use health checks UI after you've appended it as a um, dependency into your application. And you can tell what UI path this um, health UI dashboard should live. So you wonder, you may be wondering at this point, how does it know to, um, also, if, I'll, I'll zoom in just in case people can't see it. Um, you probably wonder at this, page, at, at this point, how does it go about actually knowing which API to talk to? The, rea the answer to that is just in the form of some very simple config in JSON, um, which you can tell it um, at ver various ones, like to say, this is the, the only one. This dashboard could be configured to have many different like, APIs if you want to like, list all your health checks in one go, like just to have an old whole overview. Um, it also, if anyone's wondering what this is down here, just to kind of like an additional spur, for anyone that might use like, stuff like uh, Teams or stuff like Slack, um, you can use what are called webhooks. Um, so the UI dashboard can occasionally kind of like push, like whenever it's notified of a new failure. So such as like, such as now on the interval basis, it can push um, that failure to your webhook. So it could be something like Teams or it could be something like Slack. It could go into a certain channel in Teams, for instance, and it can just like notify everyone that's subscribed to that channel that there's a, there's a failure right there. So or it could be an email, it could be anything you want. It depends how you want to notify your business like that there's a problem, essentially. Like, and maybe it's something that needs to be remedied on that, on that basis. Um, so that's the UI part that comes out of the box. Like I say, you could probably write your own URL portal if you want, but I think given how comprehensive it is out of the box, I think that's very neat in order to like, get going, if you like. However, it is extensible beyond that. So to go on to the API so side, Again, it's very, it's ruthlessly simple to integrate. So you essentially register your services up here, as you do. Um, you add the health checks that you want. So we've got a SQL Server health check, which just checks whether you can connect to a given DB with a user ID, well, user ID and password, because you may not, well, depending on the, you might want to test with credential, anything you want, like the, this, Health check even allows you to check parts of the schema, like with a SQL script if you wanted to. It could be that flexible. Um, another one is out of the box is private memory health check, where if you're using it, well, if the uh, resources it's using is within a certain threshold, and if it exceeds that, then it will notify you. And there's another one which I just customized myself called an even second time health check. Um, this is, doesn't serve any purpose then. If the current time second is an even number, then it passes. If not, then it fails. And it's just to say, I am unhealthy. The current second is not even. And I'll tell you like, which second it is. Um, obviously, that's not a real world example. But the point is, you can just implement from my health check to devise, to implement your own health check in this method. Oh, my bad. And you can simply just append it to the service registration at the start. It's as simple as that. Like, there's no controller actions, nothing like that. It's all just middleware. Well, where the data gets exposed. So the middleware part is down here where I should probably get rid of the bottom part because that was where I was just trying to illustrate where I could like, integrate with it in Jet2 and the way we contractually expose it. But um, out of the box, um, this is all you'd need, literally. Um, so it comes with a default UI response writer. So it'll, res it'll write it into a certain contract, which the um, out-of-the-box UI, which I've showed here, can communicate with. But the thing is, you can write, you can append several middlewares. So say if you wanted to expose the data in one way, but then in another way, you can, do, you can absolutely do that. You just append another middleware, add health checks. 
and you just tell it how you want that response to be written to the incoming, for the incoming request. Just to add as well, um, with the um, UI dashboard, it is, if you've got something like a deployment platform like Kubernetes, it's entirely possible you could actually point to it. Like, say if you've got a new deployment of a new application uh, that you want to c keep a monitor on, you could uh, configure it to uh, point to this UI. I, I believe you can configure it to point to this UI, whereby it will self-register itself, if you like, so you don't have to kind of like come into this dashboard and register it yourself, which I think is a pretty neat feature. Um, I think there was one more I do have to check. Um, excuse me like this. No, nope, that was it. Um, <laughs> so I think that kind of wraps everything up. Um, I appreciate this kind of brief talk, but I just kind of want to expose the value of this, like how ruthlessly simple this is out of the box. And I think why, if you're in like a organization whereby you've got an orchestra of microservices serving up a whole system, then I think this is absolutely invaluable moving forward. Like as DevOps, like I think it's just good to have that visibility and exposure as to why thing, well, like just to make sure things are behaving as they should. And if there aren't, then why isn't it? What, what aspect is of that microservices is not behaving? Or what, part, what microservices in general aren't aren't behaving in your whole system like so yeah i think all in all highly recommend that if you're doing if you're pursuing a new sp.net core development just ridiculously simple to use it's and it's it was introduced as recently as sp.net core 2.2 so if you're on that framework simply i would highly recommend having the ganders at it um, that's about it from me. I hope. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've got any. If you've got any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Do you mind showing us the response from the API? Yeah, sure. So, like I said before, um, this is the default one that comes out of the box. Um, so it writes it to a certain JSON. I can actually. Um, I could probably actually. So, uh, if I do something like. So you can see that's the JSON. That's this. I appreciate it's not the best illustrated example. Um, so that's the JSON that will come out um, in one response. But you c again, you can modify it. So like something we had in our company, where it's probably a bit more simplistic. But again, you essentially have. You can write your own response writer if you want. Like similarly as we have down here, you can have your own lambda expression um, to essentially write it out as how how you see fit you could literally like encapsulate it all under one response one dto where you've got like many different like sub dto's with all the results in or however you want it or however you want to present it it doesn't even have to be in json you could change what what content type you want to return it and it's very flexible any other questions i might don't, don't let go so forgive me should be questions um, no, that's all right. Um, uh, so this API is basically for websites, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Right. So, um, so the interaction with the API is through a UR, URL, then, isn't it? And the response yeah. that comes back is in a JSON form. a JSON, yeah. Is it? Is it? Unfortunately, we use Nagios that way. I can't stand it, but that's how we stand it. So. Is there any sort of um, um, software available that will allow Nagios to talk to an application using that framework? Well, it depends how that, like, how does it, how does it expect data, like, mm -hmm. in what kind of format? Actually, you know what? Yeah. Actually, it's obvious. You, <laughs> I shouldn't have asked you. Yeah, you, 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 you could, you could change. You write a script, you, you write a script that Nagios called, and that script can actually call yeah, it, you. you you could you could format it into whatever that the data needs to be like XML like JSON whatever you're working with like well in my experience God forbid XML but um, yeah um, again it's flexible as to how you want to like return it over a web request. Anyone for any more? I'm I'm going to hang around for a bit, but if you've got any more questions, I'm more than happy to answer them after this demo. Um, I will say thank you so much for your time.